Welcome to this last lesson. Well, today, my computer, camera, everything stopped working, sound stopped working. I've had to go back to an old computer and a different old setup that might not be great. So we'll see how that goes. The last five classes... Each have had a homework assignment that you were supposed to do and send to me, and I would go over it with you. I haven't gotten a great response. I hope you'll do this because you'll learn a lot just from writing your own prayer, speech, or story, and having me correct it with you. Today we're going to finish up with Modern Maidu by talking about borrowing from English. Then I'll show you how to go through the rest of the Modern Maidu workbook on your own or with your class and take advantage of all the other information and fun stuff you'll find in there. After we go through the Modern Maidu part, I want to show you how you can continue your studies by working with old recordings and word lists that you might have. Finally, I want to talk to you about starting your own Maidu classes. If you've finished all these lessons and you understand everything, you're qualified to teach the language yourself now. Now, maybe not everybody wants to teach, but the more teachers we have, the more chances we have of bringing this language back. And also, you should be able to say anything you want now in Maidu. I'm going to try to give you ideas for teaching the language and making the classes even more fun than these videos have been. I know that's hard to imagine. In the videos, there wasn't really time to practice and drill on each new word or new grammar. But this is where your classes can teach people even better than these videos have done. First, let's turn to page 145 in the Modern Mighty Workbook. We've learned how to get missing words by combining genuine Maidu parts, by repurposing existing words, and by borrowing from Konkau and Nisanan. Today, we're going to talk about borrowing from English. There's nothing wrong with borrowing from English. Every language borrows words. English borrows words. And a lot of languages borrow from English. As we've seen in the recordings, Maidu people were using English words in their speech even 70 years ago when Shipley was recording them. Typically, the Maidu speakers would Maiduize the words from English. For example, on page 146, there's a list of words borrowed from English which are Maiduized using Maidu sounds. The English word room is Maiduized to Lumi because Maidu doesn't have an R. So they substitute L. And it's common in Mountain Mighty to have an E at the end of the word, spelled with an I and pronounced E. Lumi. English words ending in R have that sound left off in Mighty, like floor, polowa. And notice too that Mighty does not have F, so they substituted P. On this page, there are suggestions for what letters and sounds to substitute if you want to Maiduize a word. Towards the bottom of the page, you're asked to write your name and Maiduize it with only Maidu sounds. Then on the next page, 147, there is a paragraph about whether or not to Maiduize English words. On the plus side, if you're speaking with another Maidu student in public, the English speakers around you will be less likely to understand your conversation if you Maiduize the English words. On the minus side, the person you're actually talking to might not understand what you're saying either. Whether or not you Maiduize the English words is up to you. But you do want to add the Maidu endings to your English words. 
like the speakers you heard in the recordings. Remember Mame Gallagher saying 14 years old Pem and Mucinium for machine when it was the subject and Kasu Kulwoino putting a Maidu infix and ending on the English word school. What kinds of words make sense to be borrowed from English? Well, brand names and companies like Kleenex, Subaru, iPad, artificial divisions of time, money, or measurement, things like inch, mile, hour, minute, week, ounce, pound, dollar, countries, cities, states, and areas outside of Maidu country, like San Francisco, Japan, etc. Holidays like Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter. Non-native spices, condiments, and flavorings like ketchup, vanilla, cinnamon. And acronyms or initials like PG&E, AT&T, and DMV. From pages 147 to 149, there are exercises to mitoize English words of these types. Now, besides the categories we already talked about, where you would probably want to borrow the word from English, sometimes you just want a shorter word than what you would get from genuine Maidu parts. For example, we could make up Maidu words for internet, cell phone, and email, but sometimes that would make for a very long word. So if we want to keep it short, we can just use the English word. Here on pages 149 to 150 are some examples you can look at and maybe try to Maiduize if you want. The next few pages are practice with phrases, or you might be combining a word borrowed from English with a native Maidu word. It wouldn't be bad to look these over in practice. There are some dialogues too on pages 152 to 153. Let's turn to page 154, Telling Time. Hesante kitade. What time is it? Bebom wayap. Hesante kitade. Sai choko mawasi kuludi kakan. It's 6 o'clock p.m. Awasi is borrowed from English, meaning hours. Notice I used kuludi for p.m., although kuludi technically is referring to after dark. Hours and minutes are some of those artificial time measurements that didn't exist in Maidu pre-contact times. To express the time of day, old timers might point to where the sun was or would be in the sky. Maidu use time frames rather than exact hours and minutes. See the list on page 154. Ekda, dawn or early morning. Ekdadi, at dawn. Beneki, morning. Benekdi, in the morning. Ekim esto, noon, middle of the day. Ekim estodi, at noon. Ekpe hekiti, in the afternoon or after lunch is over. Kai, evening, dinner time. Kaidi, at dinner time. Kuludi, at night or evening, dark time. Kulumini, during the evening when it was dark. Po, night, the time when we're asleep. Po esto, midnight. Po esto di, at midnight. For today's world of appointments and events that are scheduled at precise hours and minutes, how could we express these in Maidu? For example, how would you say 445? You can choose just as in English to say 445. Chuyim awasi, chuyim maishchokna, mawaka. Bebom wep, chuyim awasi, chuyim maishchokna, mawaka. Or 15 minutes to 5. Two is translated here as weedom, lacking. Mawakam awasi maishchokna mawaka weedom. Bebam wep. Mawakam awasi maishchokna mawaka weedom.
You can use Kaluti for PM and Akiti for AM, but that's not always a good Maidu translation. Remember, Kaluti means in the dark time, so 2 p.m. in English would not be Kaluti. Instead, you could take one of the Maidu time frames like Ekpe Hekati after lunch for afternoon p.m. Bebamwea, Penem Awasi Ekpe Hekati. 2 p.m., 2 in the afternoon. On page 155, where there are pictures of clocks, you can practice telling time in Maidu. The answers are on pages 344 to 345. Towards the bottom of page 155, we talk about how to say years. As you can see, these can get pretty wordy. 2023 is five syllables in English and 12 syllables in Maidu. So this might be a case where you might just want to use English. On the next page, 156, we talk about how you might express full dates, including day, month, and year. The names of the months can be borrowed from English. After all, English also borrowed these from Latin, and you can mitoize them, too, if you choose. On page 157, you can practice writing your address and phone number. We can use the word we for zero. How would you say 1602 Pine Street? Suti Sai Choko Wi Pene Pine Street, or you could say Pine Bow or Babum Cham Bow. Practice saying years, dates, addresses, and phone numbers in Maidu until it comes easy to you. It takes practice. In the last 15 video lessons, we have worked through all different ways to invent new words and reconstruct words that were lost. Even though we spent a lot of time on this, basically we've only skimmed the surface of what's in the Modern Mighty Workbook Part 1. So I'd encourage you to go back through and do the exercises and memorize the dialogues in Part 1. Now, I want to talk to you about resources you can use going forward. We have the books, videos, recordings, and game, and you may also have access to word lists, recordings, or elders who remember some words. So first, let's look at what else is in the Modern Maidu workbook. Part two of the workbook is called Using the Language, which starts on page 193. On page 195, I've supplied you with 12 extensive dialogues that you might want to memorize for real life. There are four dialogues for talking to a child, four dialogues for friends or relatives who don't live together, and four dialogues for spouses or roommates who do live together. Children's dialogues are a good place to start, even for adults. These are really monologues rather than dialogues since you don't expect the child to actually answer. Think of how we talk to our little ones. We repeat and reword what we're saying. We keep the grammar simple and the sentences short. The child is under no pressure to learn the language and may or may not answer or do what you ask, but the child is picking up the language nevertheless. For Maidu learning, try these out not only on your child, but on each other as well. Below, in the first column, the speaker A is the parent figure and B is the child, optionally answering. When the speaker refers to himself or herself, I wrote mommy, but substitute your own role for this. Mommy, Mimi, Daddy, Tata, Grandma, Min Koto, your grandmother, Grandpa, min opa, your grandfather. Aunt, min eti, your aunt. Or min kati, your paternal aunt. Uncle, min bonono, your uncle. There are four of these dialogues, going somewhere, playing inside, at the playground, and getting ready for bed. Then, there are four dialogues between people who don't live together, starting on page 201. Shopping for clothes, first day of college, 
going to an event, and gossip. Then there are four dialogues between people who do live together, starting on page 208. Children and pet chores, cooking dinner, health care, and home maintenance. These dialogues would be great to practice in your classes, or at least between a couple of students. Try your best to memorize them. I know there are some mistakes in here, and it looks like I got off track on my A and B, the person who's speaking, in Dialogue 4 on page 206. So I apologize in advance. I would be tickled if you would let me know of mistakes you find. That means, Nick Onkoi Kankano. You are surpassing me. Starting on page 215, I show you how to translate a popular song into Maidu. It's really important that you translate the underlying meaning of the song instead of just translating the words. A lot of our English language songs choose words just because they rhyme. And of course, the Maidu words with the same meaning are not going to rhyme. And you can often find better words than the Maidu version of the English words. Starting on page 221 are a few fun memes that I've translated into Maidu. See if you can understand them before you turn the page to see the English translation. I'm hoping to see you post some memes in Maidu on Facebook. If you already have the fish head or Maidu font installed on your computer, you can just open a meme in picture editing software like Paint, erase the English words, and selecting the text editor and the Maidu font, type your meme in Maidu. If I see your meme or any post you make in Maidu, I might private message you with corrections. That's how we learn. Pages 231 to 254 are about texting in Maidu. Just like when you text in English, you will likely simplify things and not bother with stress marks and so forth. The main issue is which character to use for the fish head. In the examples, I use the at sign, but really, you could use any symbol. You can teach your device my do words if you just insist on the word. Next time, it will begrudgingly offer you the my do word that you can select, but it won't do this for the words with the fish head in them, unfortunately. In these texting examples, starting on page 232, the first one is texting someone you're trying to pick up at the airport. Uniri kakas min chemenwet. Here I am without seeing you. Or, I'm here, but I don't see you. Kaikam kaletam betakon kayan pinkan. The plane just landed. Hell, bebam monodoi makas. Okay, I'll go around again. Selpon kaudi hakinuti achetniki hadoika soyo maram. Park in the cell phone lot while I get my suitcase. There are several more of these you might enjoy. Look at the Maidu conversation first and see if you can figure it out before you look at the English on the next page. Part three of the workbook is Appendices with reference chapters to dive deeper if you'd like to. Appendix A, page 255, is a grammar review. In the video classes, I've tried hard not to use technical terms, but it's almost impossible not to use words like noun, verb, adjective, subject, and object when teaching the rules of a language. Starting on page 255, all these terms are defined and explained for you, including some I made up, specific to Maidu. Appendix B, starting on page 266, is a comparison of Konkau grammar and Mount Maidu grammar. I go in the same order as the Maidu grammar book to compare each part of the grammar. Appendix C, starting on page 291, is a comparison of Nisenan grammar and Mountain Maidu grammar. I do it the same way I did for Konkau, following the same order in the Mountain Maidu grammar book. Appendix D is quotes from Maidu speakers, showing each element of grammar. The grammar book is referred to as MMG, and the page number where the grammar is talked about. 
I'll be revising the grammar book, which means the page numbers will probably be different in the new version, but hopefully you can find the right chapter where these grammar features are taught. Appendix E on page 337 is answers to the exercises in part one of the workbook, the part we already went over. Then finally, on page 347 is the Modern Maidu Dictionary, which includes all the new words we've made up or reconstructed in the lessons. So this book, the Modern Maidu Workbook, is a good resource for you to go forward with the language. The Mountain Maidu Grammar Book is also a resource. As I mentioned, I'll be revising this after I'm done with these videos correcting mistakes and adding more grammar that I didn't know about when I first wrote the book, with more examples from native speakers. You can go through and do the exercises in the grammar book as another way to learn the same grammar you learned in the video classes, and maybe even a little bit more than we covered. I use it to look things up all the time. When I revise it, I will add an index so you can find things more easily. Then there's the Mountain Maidu Dictionary, which has all the words we got from native speakers. I need to revise this too because I missed some words and I'll add more examples and some better translations sometime in the future. If you have any words from your family that you'd like me to add, send them to me. I don't know when I'll get, get it revised, but I will post the revised and improved Maidu English Dictionary on our Facebook page for you to download when I get it done. Don't forget that the dictionary has maps in the back that you, you might like. For future plans, I plan to put all the Tom Young stories in the fish head orthography with a new English translation and lots of notes to help you understand all the different nuances of these stories. If you finish these 30 video lessons, I can work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you tell your own stories and work on translations. Now, I'd like to talk to you about Maidu word lists you might have from your family or that you might find in a book. Let's start with the oldest Maidu word list I could find from a book called Native Races, printed in 1886 by Bancroft, but the word list was from Stephen Powers, who traveled all around collecting native words. The list was most likely from the 1870s. So Powers was one of the first Wollum to write down these languages. As you can see, he's comparing words from six California languages. And notice how he spells the language names. Karak, Maidu, Palegawonop, which I don't really know what he's referring to. Miwok, Yakot, and Nisanan. One thing to keep in mind is that older books refer to Konkau as Maidu, so right off the bat, we don't know if this is Konkau or Mountain Maidu here in the second column. Notice the word for man he lists as M-I-D-O-O. -O. If we didn't already know how to pronounce this, we might think it was pronounced Midu. And you would think he would at least spell the name of the language the same as the word for man, but he doesn't. So right away, we can see that his spelling is inconsistent. We can't count on the letter I being pronounced I. Next word for woman, he lists as C-A-T-E-E. -E. What do you think happened here? Where did he get this word? Well, the word for ant is kati. You can imagine this white guy trying to get words from a mighty person who doesn't speak English. He points to a woman and asks for the word. Maybe the woman is this guy's aunt, so he gives the word for aunt. In any case, kati doesn't seem to be a general word for woman in any of the Maiduan languages. So we've already run across three problems. One, what language is this? Two, what sounds do these letters represent? He's not consistent. And three, there are misunderstandings about what word he's actually asking for and getting. Third one down, son. He has P-O-C-U-M. We don't know where the stress is on any of these. That's a fourth problem. But also, we do know that sun and moon are poco. 
He uses the same letter C to mean both kinds of K's. So again, we can't rely on his spelling. Also, he doesn't write poco, he writes pocum, um at the end. This tells us two things. One, he's not listening for the exact sound, which is o. And two, he's adding the M on the end of this word, but he didn't write the M on the end of maida or kati. We know that either with or without the M is correct when you're saying single words, but since he's writing a word list, he should be consistent. Either all the nouns should end in M or none of them. Then there are a couple of words on his list that end in E, e H, when they should end in E, the E sound. Fourth one down, Kawe, should be Kawi. And the sixth one down, Mome, should be Momi. The fifth one down, Dog, should be S, with the fish head sound. Look how he spells the fish head, E Y U. So this list is pretty useless if you're trying to learn how to pronounce the words. Luckily, we already know these words. As we go down the list, there are a couple of words that show whether this language is Konkau or Mountain Mighty. Can you see which ones they are? The word for big is H-A-Y-L-I-N. That is definitely not Mountain Mighty. In Konkau, big is Helim. Then the word for eat in the list is P-I-N. In Mountain Maidu, pin is hear or listen and pa is eat. Putting an N on the end of pen would be a concow way of saying eating. In Mountain Maidu, it would be pedom, hukinuka. So this old list is actually concow and it's not written in any consistent way to know how the words were pronounced. We can't even count on the meanings being correct. I'm showing you this so you'll use caution when you look at old lists. Here's another word list from Plumas Memories, 1962. I believe this word list came from Mary Dunn. Let's skip the place names and go down to dwelling or home. She writes komi. This must be a winter house, kumu. But the vowels are really off. Then going to girl, kulem, b-u-b-a. How would we spell the b-u-b-a part? This is actually pube. A glottalized p does sound a lot like a b, but it looks like when she writes an a at the end, she's expecting us to pronounce it like a long a. Would you have guessed this if you didn't already know the word? I wouldn't. The same for bear. A brown bear is mude, and she puts an A at the end. For grandma, she writes min koto, which actually means your grandma. For father, she writes m-u-b-a-k-a. So one of the A's is pronounced A, and the other one is pronounced as a fish head. Can you see the problems here? These lists that are so inconsistent are not very helpful. In the words for spring, fall, and winter that end in many, she uses the spelling M-A-N-Y like the English word many. <laughs> but that A does not sound like the other A she's used. So really, we can't count on her spelling to show us how things were pronounced. If we didn't already know how to pronounce these words, we would most likely be saying them all wrong. In the book Picking Willows by Pat Lindgren Kurtz, the author writes down a prayer that Lily Baker's mother, Daisy, used to say when she smashed choke cherries. Here's how Kurtz wrote it. Kurtz says the translation is, eyeball, eyeball, knock it open, knock it open. It would be great to know what this prayer really says. Hesarum balmaro maka, the first line. Hini kupem, the one who has eyes. Hini means eyes, but also means round berries. It was a fun pun, and according to our teacher, was sometimes used to gross the kids out when offering them berries. In the dictionary, 
you'll find that some words about eyes start with hinis. So I think hinis kupem means the one who has eyes or the one who has berries. She's talking to that bush or tree. Since we can figure out this part of the prayer, we can see already how inconsistent the spelling is. She spells the eyes of hini with ease. But she also uses the letter E for Pem, which is an E sound. She spells Kupem as Ko Pem. Now the second line, which Kurtz translates as knock it open, I really can't tell what the real words are from what she's written. Looks like Boo House Chugnano. I've tried many times to figure this out. If only Kurtz had given us a decoder key to know how it was pronounced. So the lesson I hope we all learn from this is to write things down in a way that other people can be able to pronounce the words. Be consistent. You can use Shipley's way of writing or fish head. Just don't mix them up. If you have your own writing system, please include a decoder key showing what each letter sounds like, sort of like this. And don't forget to write the stress marks that show which part of the word is said louder. Otherwise, we don't know if the word is mako or mako. If you have lists like these in your family, please sit with an elder as soon as possible and go over the words with them. How do they pronounce the words? Then rewrite them in a consistent way. And also, it's a good idea to record the elders saying these words. Now, let's talk about actual recordings where the mighty words don't exactly match the English translation. When William Shipley first started working with Mame Gallagher, there were misunderstandings between them as Shipley was trying to get certain information and Mame Gallagher was trying her best to supply him with what he needed. One of their first recordings together was Mighty Glosses. Gloss means an explanation or translation of an unfamiliar word. Shipley could have called this mighty words and phrases instead of glosses. Here are some examples in the mighty glosses recordings that show misunderstandings. Shipley asked for the word bear. Uh, bear. Mude. Mude. Uh, brown bear. Mame Gallagher says the word for brown bear, mude. Then Shipley asks her the word for brown bear. So she interprets this as he wants the color brown rather than the species of bear. So she says, chulalakpem mude, a brown colored brown bear. Then Shipley asks for a grizzly bear. A uh, grizzly bear. Mompano. Mompano. Mame Gallagher makes a mistake here. She says water grizzly, mompano, which is the word for otter. The word for grizzly is just pano. At this point, I think Mame Gallagher was a little rusty on speaking mighty, but she remembered more as she worked on it with Shipley. It's often the case where Shipley's trying to get the name of a species of animal, but Mame Gallagher interprets that he's asking for a description. For example, he asks for a water snake. And a snake? Huska. Huska. And a water snake. Momim huska. Momim huska. And she answers, Momim huska. He asks for a brush rabbit. And, and a brush rabbit. Pam kolikasi. And she says, Pom Kowekasi. These are literal translations. So this is one type of communication problem. You have to read between the lines to know which words are not exactly what is being asked for. Always suspect words where a color or other describing word is directly translated in Maidu, like Pom, Momim, and Chulalakpem. Another example, Shipley asks for a blackbird. A blackbird. Susie Pim Chakati. Susie Pim Chakati. 
and she says, Siu Siu Pem Chakati. Chakati by itself already means the species we call blackbird. So she says, a black blackbird. Shipley asked for the word for wolf. A wolf? Wepa. And Mame Gallagher answers with the word for coyote, wepa. Wolves were extinct in California at that time. There is a mighty word for wolf, but Mame Gallagher gives the word for coyote. Here are some examples of sentences Shipley is asking for as he's trying to figure out Maidu grammar. Uh, that woman slept in the woods. Kalem tuidom yamandi. Kalem tuidom yamandi. What does Mame Gallagher actually say? A woman sleeping on a mountain. She killed a snake. Wanatidum huska. Wanatidum huska. What does Mame Gallagher actually say? Killing a snake. Uh, the snake died. Huska wanadum. Huskam wanadum. What does Mam Gallagher actually say? Snake dying. Uh, she killed a snake with a rock. Oh no, as one. Oh no, as only. Wadam what does Mame Gallagher actually say? Hitting on the head with a rock, I killed a big snake. Notice she answers with I killed rather than she killed. Then Shipley tries to figure out if Maidu has a different word for he and she like English does. So he asks her to say, she gave him a basket. How do you say uh, she gave him a basket? Munkalemas or... Maidu <clears throat> So she's saying, the woman and the man. She says it instead of using the pronouns that he was asking for. I never say it. She gave him. You'd always say that woman gave that man. So the answer is, of course, Maidu does not have a different pronoun for he and she. It's kind of humorous how they're both trying to work together, but they're not on the same wavelength yet. Later, they became good friends and were able to communicate with each other so much better. If you listen to the Maidu Glosses recordings, you'll likely find other cases of misunderstanding. I'm pointing all this out so you'll know that many times the old speakers misinterpreted what was being asked for and instead gave some other information. If you have old word lists, look out for some examples of this. Here's another example of a recording where Herb Young gives us some Maidu lessons. In this recording, Herb Young says a phrase in Maidu, then he translates it into English. I guess the winter will be over sometimes. Now, what did he really say? Well, when winter ends, once the weather clears up, we will be strong. And how is the cold up in your part of the country? Now, what did he really say?
So, in your country, how have the coughs and colds been? Instead of talking about cold weather, he's talking about illness, coughing, Hong Kong. Those are a couple of examples where his translations into English don't exactly match the Maidu. You know enough now to be able to figure out what he's really saying. Now, let's talk about getting recordings and working with them. All of the Shipley recordings are available for free online. You can just download them to your device or computer. Do a Google search for William Shipley Maidu recordings. It will probably be the first result you get. If you have old cassette tapes of people speaking the language, you can always get those on your device in a couple of ways. One way is to play the tape while recording it on your device. Or you can buy a converter like this that connects to your computer via USB. It plays the cassette tape and converts it to an MP3 music file. These converters run about $35. I call this digitizing a recording. Once the recording is digitized, you can do a lot with it. I recommend that you download Audacity, which is free software. If you already have downloaded or digitized the recording and you want to work with it, you'll use the file menu in Audacity and select Import Audio to get it into Audacity. Here are just a few of the things you can do. You can cut out parts you don't want by selecting that part and clicking on the scissors icon. You can divide the recording up into sentences or song tracks and save them out separately. To do this, play the audio and select one part, say one song or one sentence. Then with that highlighted, pick export selected audio from the file menu. I like to divide up a recording into sentences so I can play the hard ones over and over. You can also slow down the recording or any part of the recording. To do this, select the part of your recording you want to slow down or do select all. Then go to the effects menu and select change tempo. You will be tempted to select change speed, but don't do it. That will distort the audio and it won't help you. Changing the tempo, I think, puts spaces between the words or syllables without distorting them. This is what I always use. It then shows you these options. The only one I fill in is the percent change, minus 20, which means I want it slowed down 20%. Then I click OK. When you make changes to the recording like this, you should export it with a different name from the original, like sentence 1, slowed. When you close out Audacity, it asks if you want to save. I always say no, because you should be exporting and not saving. I'm afraid of overwriting my originals. There are all kinds of options here that you might want to experiment with. I hardly use any of these. You can get rid of background noise and improve the sound quality of your recording if you know what you're doing. Now, I want to talk about teaching your own classes. If you've finished all these 30 classes and understand everything, I hope you'll turn around and teach more people yourself. All of us make mistakes and will continue to make mistakes. But if you've completed all these classes, including the homework, you know a lot. Now you're qualified to teach the Maidu language because you understand the grammar. As you teach vocabulary, Encourage your students to make flashcards to help them memorize new words. You, as a teacher, can make a list of the new words so everyone knows how to spell them. As we've just seen, spelling is important if you want to know how to pronounce that word later. And that includes the stress marks in each word. If you don't already have the fish head or my do font installed, the font and instructions are in the files on our Facebook page. If you want some guidance, email me and I'll help you get it installed on your computer. As your students learn more vocabulary, you can have contests in your class, either individuals or teams, sort of like a game show, where you give them a word in English and they have to say it in my do. 
We used to play a game in our class where a basket was filled with little pieces of paper with words on them. And you'd pull out one of the papers and have to tell what the word is in English. We used to play it in teams so no one would feel embarrassed. But as the class gets more advanced, you could have individuals competing. Another idea is to have pictures on the pieces of paper instead of words, and the students have to name the picture in Maidu. For more advanced classes, they have to say a sentence about the picture. You can use the video classes as your guide or the grammar book and just expand on these. Turn to Lesson 1 in the grammar book. The exercises have you translating from Maidu to English and English to Maidu, with this lesson being about the M ending and how that M changes the meaning of the sentence. You can use these as an example, but change out the nouns and verbs. For example, Maidam Kutatu Wonotikan is the first one. Make all different sentences out of this one sentence by substituting other words. Instead of maidam, you could have panam or wepam. Instead of wonotikan, you could have hekoikan, chased off, or donkan, caught. Instead of kutata, you could have sumi or huska. Have the students practice this over and over until they don't have to think about it. They just know where to put the M, and they know how to translate the sentences back and forth between the languages. Since the M subject is one of the hardest things to learn and remember about Maidu, I would recommend spending a lot of time practicing this with your class. You can do the same type of practicing with lessons 2 and 3 in the grammar book. Repetition and drilling on grammar and vocabulary is very much needed, and I didn't do this in the video lessons due to lack of time, but you should definitely do this. Here's what I mean by drilling. Turn to lesson four in the grammar book. Here, we're learning about the past present verb tense in Maidu. The students already know about the con ending for third person, but now they're being introduced to the endings for the other persons, like first person ka si. See how I have the lines in front of each ending? That's where you plug in a verb of your choice. It's fill in the blank. After teaching the students these endings, practice, practice, practice with different verbs. Maybe you're still using the basket with scraps of paper, but this time you fill in the blank to make a little sentence, a koi kasi. The student who draws this piece of paper would have to translate into English, I went. Or you could have the English, and if they draw that, they have to say it in Maidu. Again, you could have the game show type of contest where two or more opponents are up in front of the class having to translate on the spot and racking up points if they get it right. You could also skip around asking, how do you say, we too went, or how do you say, you ate, and they would have to be on their toes knowing the verbs and the right endings. Throughout the grammar book, there are these paradigms with a line for fill in the blank in front of the ending. And you can do the same thing for all of these. After teaching the endings, you keep plugging in different verbs and asking, how would you say this? How would you say that? With the different persons. That's what I call drilling. One of the first things you'll want to teach your class is how to say the greetings. Have each person in the class greet the person next to them and answer back and forth. And then that person turns and does the same to the next person. So everybody gets to practice. Later, as your class gets more advanced, the students will ask and answer where they're from, who their grandparents are, where they live now, etc. I can't say enough about how important memorization is. Our teacher had us perform skits in public. It was so hard having to learn and memorize our lines and then hope we didn't mess up. Nothing helps you memorize better than knowing you're going to be performing in front of people. So I would suggest you have your class memorize dialogues and skits. I've shown you the dialogues I've written up in the Modern Mighty Workbook. There are a lot of them, so that would be a good place to start. If you write your own skits, I would be happy to look them over for mistakes before you give them to your classes. 
I know I have made mistakes in my dialogues that I've written. So it's always good to have another set of eyes helping you out. Another idea for your class, songs. Sometimes you remember better if you sing it. Remember the counting song from lesson two? If you put something in a song, it makes it easier to remember. For your more advanced classes, another game that would be fun is to have a student invent a new word using any of the methods we've learned and try to get the class to guess what it means. I want to mention a great method that's being used with a lot of languages called Where Are Your Keys? This way of learning combines sign language with speaking so that the motions you make with your hands, arms, even your face work together to help you remember. Two mighty people with experience in the Where Are Your Keys method are Paul Cassone and Danny Manning. Thanks to Paul Cassone for providing us with some videos to show how Where Are Your Keys works. Here's just a sample to give you an idea. I'll provide links to the full videos on our Facebook page. Looking towards the future, wouldn't it be fun to have larger competitions with the best students from different regional Maidu classes competing against each other? In former times, we know that when Maidu people got together for big times, there were usually competitions involving races, games, and showing your skills. Why not add in language competitions with some prizes? So this concludes the video classes in Mountain Maidu. You should be able to say anything you want now, and you should be able to say it correctly, and you should be able to teach classes. At this time, I want to acknowledge that all these video lessons, the books I've written, the Maidu game, none of these would have been possible. None of these would have come about if it hadn't been for one person, Farrell, Yatam, Cunningham, my teacher, Mu Huki Chik Menta Pa'a, Niseki Oyupaipem, Makpapayatika Yatam, Yahat Bispada. Hanenno, Nia Hennia Henno. Hanenno nia hennia henno Hanenno nia hennia henno